First of all, I am from the British Museum and I want to invite you all, if you're inspired after the talk, to come um, see our amazing collections um, and to let you know that we are currently in the process of um, redesigning our galleries, um, which will open in 2018. Um, so it's a great time to really think about these big issues and big topics and we're certainly thinking about them a lot. So I'm going to take you on a complete whirlwind um, historical tour all over the globe, um, but I really wanted to give you an impression of how diverse and broad this topic is um, and the production of art um, in relation to Islam. Um, so without further ado, um, the religion of Islam um, has existed since the revelations received by Muhammad in um, 610 AD up and oh sorry did it just change no, no, no. <laughs> giving away all the secrets <laughs> until his uh, death in 632 AD and the religion very very quickly spread from Spain to Southeast Asia um, and has been practiced around the world for over a thousand years um, and throughout my presentation I want to emphasize the diversity of approaches to art um, that have developed along with Islam um, and that we see throughout this long history um, there are a few um, unifying themes, um, and that's why I picked this opening image, because we see a few of those themes. This is a contemporary work from 1987, um, but we see some things that recur. Um, for example, there's an Arabic letter which represents calligraphy. Uh, there's the Kaaba, which is the um, central shrine of Islam, where you make your Hajj or pilgrimage. Um, they're the feet of Muhammad, um, which is a common way of representing Muhammad when you don't want to represent him um, as himself. And um, there's a hand, um, which is often called the hand of Fatima, um, who was a daughter of Muhammad and is a very a personal, religious, devotional symbol, which you may have seen if you've traveled around North Africa or the Middle East. Um, Another recurring theme uh, is aniconism, which was mentioned in the, the opening description, which um, is commonly defined as the absence of representational imagery in religious spaces. Um, however, we will see throughout this presentation, this concept is not universal, it's very common, um, but there are exceptions. Um, and the main point is that um, the lecture will demonstrate how geography, power, and to a large extent taste played a role in shaping um, what we see today as Islamic art and also Muslim approaches to art throughout history. Um, so my talk is focused on um, the relationship between the religion of Islam and artistic production. Um, so I'm not showing the entire production of art on, in lands um, where the majority faith was Islam or under Islamic rule. So it's important to remember that what, there was a lot of art being produced um, that I'm not going to show, and that was produced by um, people of all faiths who were living um, in the Middle East or, or lands that were um, a majority Islamic faiths. Uh, and also I'm going to talk about production of art and rather than the um, destruction of art. Um, so looking at what was produced in the, the Islamic lands. Um, I will touch a bit on iconoclasm, but um, it's a very complex issue. Um, so next slide, now. <laughs> so there's a common misconception uh, that in uh, the, the Quran forbids art or production of images or human figures. Um, contrary to this belief, there is nothing in the Quran, uh, the holy book of Islam, forbidding the creation of images um, either of religious figures or any type of figure. Um, the passage most often linked, the passages most often linked with the idea of iconoclasm or aniconism um, forbid the worship of idols. So this is very similar to most Abrahamic religions. Um, it, it's concerned with um, the fear of worshiping false idols. Um, so I have two passages here, one um, concerning Abraham, and it's directly about false idols, and it does use a word that's often translated as, as statues. Um, but then the second passage um, is about Solomon, and it's celebrating the production of statues in his palace. Um, so if there is nothing in the Quran, um, where do these ideas come from? Oh, and I have a picture of um, Solomon from a, um Iranian box. Um, which I'm very happy to see that the word Solomon is <laughs> also above you. Um, so next slide. Um, so aversion to images begins in the hadith, um, which is mostly concerned with figural images, 
and the hadith are a collection of, say, of reports said to be sayings from the Prophet Muhammad or from witnesses who lived during his time. Um, and they were collected um, over a long period of time. These are some of the earliest surviving manuscripts we have from the ninth century. And the one about on the top is one of the most frequently cited in this regard. And it is about um, uh, Aisha, uh, one of the wives of uh, Muhammad, and uh, she buys a cushion and um, with a picture on it. We think of animals, and um, uh, Muhammad says this is a sin. And so this uh, is cited a lot in relation to um, anarchism, whether there can be images um, in Islam. And then the, the second one I picked because it's very, very interesting and it shows how complex this issue is. And it's about um, that the Kaaba was used um, before Islam uh, as a shrine um, to many different gods. And there is a story of Muhammad going in to the Kaaba and destroying most of the images. But um, one of the stories is that he said there was a painting of Mary and Jesus in, in the Kaaba and he said he put his hands over it and said, don't, don't destroy that. So um, it just shows you how complex this is. Um, but let's look at some practical images um, of what was actually happening on the ground um, in early Islam. So next slide. Um, so perhaps the most important thing to look at in early Islam is the context in which it developed. Um, so Muslims quickly expanded after the death of Muhammad and took over areas in the Middle East and North Africa. Their first capital after Medina was Damascus. And this area was previously ruled by the Byzantine Empire. As we can see from the quotation on this slide, Christians in the Byzantine Empire were also concerned about representations, idol worship, things like this, iconoclasm. And there's a lot of debate as to whether Byzantine iconoclasm had and their um, concern about whether they should make religious images influenced Islam in any way, and it's a, quite a big debate. Um, but um, what we see here is uh, church mosaics from what is now Jordan uh, in a Byzantine church uh, in the eighth, uh, in the sorry, in the sixth century. Um, and at first, modern scholars thought that um, when the Muslims came and conquered this region, they had compelled the Byzantines to destroy their images in their churches. But now um, it is actually believed that this was a much more haphazard practice and it was coming more internally from local Christian communities concerned with whether they should have images at all in their churches. And you see this um, very haphazardly, but in certain areas around Syria um, and in modern Jordan. But what's very interesting here is that they didn't completely destroy the images. We see um, that they left often um, bits of the figure, or even in some places they would um, change the one part of the figure and then leave another figure on the other side. And we'll come back to this. This, is, um, this happens qu quite often. Um, so um, that is in the same context as we see the very first um, bits of Islamic art appearing. So next slide. So this is from the Great Mosque in Damascus. Um, and unlike Christian churches, Islamic mosques did not include figures from the very earliest surviving mosques. Um, this suggests that at the very earliest stages of Islam, there was a notion that figures, and particularly religious figures, should not be shown in religious contexts such as mosques or Qurans. Um, and actually considering the Byzantine context in which um, this architecture was being developed, this is not as wholly obvious as it might seem to us today. Um, the first mosque, such as the Friday Mosque of Damascus, um, this was built in 705 to 715 AD, or the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, um, took their inspiration from Byzantine buildings. So the decoration is very similar to um, the mosaics in a Byzantine building, um, but they have removed the figures. Uh, so next slide. Uh, the, remo the removal of figures happened in the mosque and other religious contexts, but not in the secular realm. This uh, is a palace, um, and um, it's in present-day Jordan, and it's in a small bathhouse that survives from the palace. Um, and you can see a, a hunt scene on the left, and on the right um, is a female dancer. 
And uh, we see this in most of the palaces that survived from the very earliest Islamic period in, um, in Jordan and Syria. And so it's clear that there was a very strong distinction between the secular realm and the, the religious realm. Next slide. Um, the only exception uh, to this secular religious divide is coinage. Um, and I think this is one of the most um, sort of amazing transformations in history. Um, so um, the change um, in, into the Islamic period can see, be seen in the coin development. Um, the first Islamic coins, just like the mosques, uh, took their inspiration from Byzantine compositions with very small Islamic edits. So on the top uh, left, you have the Byzantine coin, and on the bottom left, you have the uh, Islamic coin um, from around the same period. Um, and the dinar of Abd al-Malik that you see um, in it, the crosses have been removed. So you just have a stick without a cr uh, cross on it. Um, and also the hats have been removed and the figures have been given beards. And obviously the Greek has been replaced with Arabic. Um, so um, this was a political strategy which allowed the Islamic rulers to um, establish their rule over um, their Byzantine subjects. Um, but by the late 7th century, something very different happened. All the figures were removed from Islamic coins, um, and the coins were filled with Arabic inscriptions. Um, and they almost always, in this early period, say the same thing, which is um, a very famous passage from the Quran. Um, that you see in the center. Um, so um, it's a very powerful statement about um, the new religion. Next slide. So um, after that, calligraphy and Quranic passages became very important for decorative elements in Islamic art, and many variations of script developed. Um, next slide. In religious buildings, calligraphy took many forms, often decorating the most important parts of the structure, such as the minaret, um, which is the prayer tower where the call to prayer is made, the mihrab, which is where it um, shows the direction of prayer, um, and at the entrances to mosques. Certain Quranic passages appear more frequently in mosques um, than others, um, and they were established as appropriate for certain contexts in mosques. These two minarets were built by rulers in the Ghaznavid dynasty in Afghanistan um, in the 11th and 12th centuries, and they show some very interesting calligraphic styles. So next slide. So on the, on the left, we have the minaret of Masud III, uh, and the calligraphy um, actually turns into foliage decoration. So um, it's a bit hard to see here, but the tops of the um, the letters actually turn into plants, and it's a very amazing style. And then the one on the right, um, you won't, might not even be able to tell it's writing because it's this amazing square Kufic style that developed um, out of, into geometric forms. So they would take a square and um, fill it with calligraphy in such a way that it almost looks like a maze. And so um, part of the practice was to decipher what was said in, the, in these squares. Um, so it's interesting, within a very short time period, you get these two completely different styles. Next slide. So calligraphy was also used on secular artwork as well, um, and it became one of the defining features of the Islamic world and really a unique um, decorative feature um, to um, the religion of Islam. Uh, this beautiful, um, mod strikingly modern-looking dish um, was made by a dynasty ruling Central Asia in the 10th century. Um, and uh, the bowl actually doesn't have any religious messages, but they are a group of amazing bowls that um, give proverbs. So this one says, He who speaks, his speech is silver, but silence is a ruby with good health and prosperity. Um, and what's really amazing is the way the artist has used calligraphy to create um, the composition. So um, with the long um, lines, um, which um, could either be the letter, um, the sound A or L, um, he creates this, um, breaks up the, the structure and creates a wonderful composition. Next slide. Um, metal objects also um, are decorated with um, calligraphy. 
uh, this ewer um, uh, is basically using calligraphy as the main um, structure of the entire piece. So um, it fills the, the structure and um, separates out the different sections. And what's interesting is often you see that um, these objects that would have been used in a religious context um, are predominantly filled with calligraphy and you'll get the exact same shape of, of objects but with figural decoration that might have been used in a secular context. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the line was not always clear between figural and calligraphic decoration. This pen box made in the early 13th century, um, probably in Iran, uh, shows uh, the tops of letters actually have little heads on them. So they've actually become figures themselves. Um, and this style of script was extremely common on secular objects um, during this period, and which is quite fascinating. And uh, next slide. So, um, the relationship between script and image um, was often delineated um, fairly clearly um, in objects for secular and um, religious usage. Um, if the passage of writing used in the calligraphy was from a secular context, the artwork often included figures um, depicting the scene or um, from another uh, story or historical scene. And if the passage was from the Quran or some other religious context, it often uh, was an iconic or non-figural. Um, so we see a perfect example of that in these two tiles from almost an identical time period, an um, identical place, um, and uh, in Iran, in a place called Kashan, which was making tiles like this um, during this period. Um, and the one on the, um, on the right shows uh, a Quranic passage, and so it has foliate, foliate decoration. Um, sorry, on the on your right, <laughs> yes. Um, and then the other one is a poem um, about love. So it shows two figures together, um, and you can actually often um, assume when you see figures on a um, on a medieval work like this that the passage will probably be a poem or a story and, and not religious. Um, so people did not always agree, though, on what was acceptable representation in religious works. Um, in this series of tiles from the 14th century, from a tomb in Iran, uh, the original work included a Quranic passage with birds surrounding it. Um, later, uh, we don't know what, exactly when, someone removed the heads of the birds. Um, so you can see here, all the, the heads of the birds are removed. So there are two important points here. First is um, that there was not an agreement on what type of figuration or whether figuration was acceptable um, in, uh, in Islamic context, or in this case, there's a Quranic passage with a Quranic passage. Um, secondly, the important point is that the birds' bodies are left intact. So um, in a large part of this practice in the medieval period, um, what was really important was removing the eyes and the head um, because the concern was that um, there was actually a spirit or a living thing inside of this figure that was um, painted or sculpted. And so once the eyes or the head was removed, it was believed the spirit was gone. And so in, at that point, in many ways, it was still acceptable. Um, and um, one scholar, um, who is unfortunately not me, but had made a, has made a very good point on the subject that um, it wasn't uh, that they were anti-aesthetic or that they were against the beauty of the work, um, but it was more destroying the spirit. And once that was done, um, the works were largely left intact. Um, so next slide. We can perhaps see this most interestingly <laughs> and um, in the Qutub Mosque uh, complex, which is in Delhi, um, which was built in the late 12th, early 13th century, um, which uses extensive um, spolia or um, leftover pieces from the Hindu and Jain temples, um, which were destroyed to create this mosque. Um, and basically, almost all the sculptures are reused and in, um, used to make the columns, but the heads are removed, um, just as in the last slide. Um, and it's very interesting that most pre-modern Islamic visitors to um, the site barely notice the statues. What they're really amazed by are the um, inscriptions, the calligraphy inside the mosque. So that's almost all the references that we get to it. 
um, there's only one writer who, um, during the period who ever even mentions the, these sculptures. And he says, um, with strange figures and marvelous engravings ex executed with remarkable skill. So um, next slide. Um, so that is in the Indian subcontinent. And another impor important point is that every region was quite dr different in the medieval period in their approach. Um, so this is in North Africa, and North Africa um, was much more aniconic. So most mosques um, had hardly any decoration, uh, and if it was, it was mostly geometric. This is in Morocco um, from the uh, 12th century. Um, and so uh, it's a completely different approach to, um, uh, to mosque design and religious context. Uh, next slide. So um, I am now going to look at how um, actual religious scenes were depicted, uh, mostly in manuscripts. Um, first, looking at Muhammad's life uh, in manuscript illumination. Um, so um, one of the earliest and most famous depictions of Muhammad is in the Jamia al-Tawarik, written by Rashid al-Din, um, who lived in the Mongol Sultanate in Iran during the 13th and 14th century. Um, and uh, this, uh, as you know, the Mongols came um, from farther east um, and uh, took over large areas of the Middle East, bringing a lot of their culture with them. Um, and very interesting, Rish interestingly, Rashid Adin was um, born in a Jewish family. He later converted to Islam along with many of the Mongols um, and produced the mo this most amazing work, which is an entire history of the world. Um, it's, in, it's in Edinburgh now um, and has amazing images. <laughs> and among them is the story of Muhammad. Um, and, um, this um, shows Muhammad's night journey, or mirage, um, where he, uh, it is said that he ascended into heaven on a donkey um, and met many prophets and angels. Um, and what's very um, difficult about this is that we've lost almost all manuscripts of illuminations from previous, uh, from before this. So we really don't know where this comes from. It sort of comes out of the blue um, in history because of uh, the loss of material. Um, but it's very fascinating because we can see mixtures of Chinese influences, of um, uh, Christian imagery, of all sorts of different um, influences coming together to create um, this image which persists for, for thousands of years. So are the community lost? Is that destroyed or just? No, we just, just uh, yeah, lost yeah, over time, um, unfortunately. Um, so, um, next slide. So um, Muhammad and other prophets continued to be depicted. Um, this practice was most strong in the Iranian world, um, which um, was actually a much larger area in the pre-modern <coughs> period, so also including parts of Central Asia. Um, and uh, this painting is in the Shia tradition um, because we see Ali also depicted, um, uh, who was a cousin of, um, of Muhammad and his sons Hassan and Hussein, and also the sword of Ali, which is an important um, Shia symbol, is um, in the center of the image. Um, next slide. But um, there also developed a tradition of depicting Muhammad uh, with a veil over his face, um, and uh, also most um, religious figures uh, were depicted this way in, in a lot of manuscripts. So um, here in this Turkish manuscript, we see um, Ali uh, fighting in the center, and then Muhammad also veiled um, in the top, and you can usually um, notice them because they have a fire halo around them. Uh, next slide. So um, showing these different approaches to whether or not the, the figure should be shown, the religious figure, I find this passage really fascinating from an auction in Turkey. Um, uh, during the, I think it's the 17th century, yes, um, and basically, um, I won't read the whole thing, but uh, someone comes and destroys the faces on a manuscript that's being sold in the auction, and the auctioneer's reaction um, is, people of Muhammad, see what this Philistine has done to this Shahnameh, which is a famous um, illustrated book. He poked out the eyes or cut the throats of all the people in the pictures with his knife or rubbed their faces with a sponge. Um, so it's interesting that you get 
you know, it, it's really, um, we see that it changes from person to person, from town to town, um, the, the reactions, um, and in this case, they're calling uh, him a the person who did this a Philistine, so it's, it's quite an interesting um, mix. Next slide. Uh, in contemporary society, as you know, it's, it's quite a sensitive uh, issue, and it's uh, artists today um, approach the issue of the depiction of Muhammad in, in many different ways. Um, so uh, the, the artist that I showed in the beginning of my talk uses this very interesting abstract uh, method of bringing together all the different attributes and actually he calls his, um, his paintings or his prints um, the same name as the book that we saw made by the, um, the Mongol painter um, uh, in, from the 14th century. So it's very interesting. He's playing on the, that very long tradition, but in his own very interesting modern abstract way. <laughs> And then in Iran, as I said, the tradition of depicting Muhammad um, is uh, very long-standing historically. And this poster was made uh, in the 1990s. Um, and um, this image uh, was quite common up until, until recently in, um, around Iran. Um, you can see it in the bazaar and things like that. And at the bottom it just says, uh, Muhammad is the messenger of God. Um, and it's interesting because um, this image has a a legend around it that it comes from, um, there's a story about Muhammad that um, a Christian monk saw him on the way to Syria and recognized him when he was a child. Uh, and so the legend of this image, which is uh, you know, produced in the 20th century, is that this is the original image that this monk painted of him when, when he saw him. So it's quite interesting. Next slide. Um, so the other very important um, representation um, that we see in manuscripts and across art uh, of um, a part of Islamic practice is the Hajj or the pilgrimage, um, which every um, is one of the five pillars of Islam set out in the Quran. So it's um, something that um, every Muslim is supposed to do um, in their lifetime. Um, and this is a, one of the most wonderful, famous um, paintings from the Islamic world. It's from the 13th century um, from Iraq, uh, and it depicts the, the um, elaborate processional of the Hajj. Um, it's one of the very earliest depictions of the Hajj. And what's really um, exciting about it as well is this yellow tent that you see on top of the camel. Um, and if you go to the next slide, I can show you what that is. Um, so that is what is called a mahmal, uh, and it was produced in Egypt and brought in a very grand ceremony to Mecca every year. Um, for hundreds of years, it stopped in uh, 1952, um, and it's usually covered in ca calligraphy and iconic designs and um, was one of the most important symbols um, of Cairo coming on the Hajj every year. Um, so, next slide. So um, besides this uh, grand organized communal devotion, there's also personal devotion. Um, and um, the most common object of personal devotion is the Quran. And many very small Qurans were produced um, so that you could take them with you. Um, and at times they were even uh, sewn the pages of the Quran into clothes to protect um, the, the wearer. And this is the Hamsa, or the hand of Fatima, which we actually saw in the first slide in the print, um, one of these hands. And they were used to ward off evil. They're actually a very old pre-Islamic um, uh, symbol, but they were, in Islam, uh, they were interpreted as the five pillars of the five fingers, and also the hand of the daughter of Muhammad. Um, and what's really interesting is that we see um, on the right a headdress, um, from Palestine uh, where these hands are sewn in um, to protect the woman uh, when she's wearing them and that's quite common um, in costume to see them. So next slide. So um, how does this uh, manifest itself in 20th and 21st century art, um, which is obviously extremely different from um, all the other images I've shown you previously except for a few 20th century ones. Um, and uh, it's very interesting how these modern uh, Muslims are um, looking at faith in, in, their, in their art. Um, and this one is depicting Hajj uh, and is by a Saudi artist called Mahamula, 
Malu, um, and she's contrasting the pre-modern Hajj um, with the modern Hajj. So actually the background, um, which is difficult to see, is made of um, one of these textiles, like what we saw on the thing that went on the camel, the Mahmal. Um, but then the front is actually her childhood toys um, in which she creates a fantasy of what the modern Hajj is like for her and um, the idea of, of Mecca and, and going to Mecca. Um, so it's quite an interesting combination. Uh, next slide. Uh, this uh, image is uh, by Ahmed Mater, who is a an, an really interesting artist working in Saudi Arabia today. Um, and he uses a magnet to um, give the impression of the Hajj. And in this, the magnet is the Kaaba, which is um, the shrine that you're supposed to walk around. Um, and what's really interesting is that he points out that the um, iron filings that he uses to represent people are all the same and that's um, the way that um, you are supposed to feel on Hajj, that everyone's the same in God's eyes. Um, so that was one of the messages he was trying to give across because um, everyone changes into very simple clothes um, to all, you know, sort of just focus on, on religion when they're, they're there. Um, so, and what's very interesting is this is a work he did in 2012 and recently he's been doing a lot of work on um, the on the construction going on in Mecca. Um, so, you know, they're not, they're, these artists are also looking critically um, at uh, what's happening with religion today. Um, and so that work is, is quite fascinating. Um, so he's, he's looking at the whole picture, really interesting. Next slide. Uh, so one of the most important um, ways that modern contemporary artists um, express Islam is through calligraphy. Uh, and this happened in a very interesting way. This is an Iranian artist, um, Charles Hussein Zandarudi, and um, he was one of the first modern Middle Eastern artists to use calligraphy. Um, and they were responding to a criticism that they were going and learning art in the West, in, um, in Western art schools, and they were forgetting their own identity. So the way they sort of reclaim their own identity is by looking at calligraphy and incorporating it into abstract compositions. Um, and this is a really interesting practice. So he was part of a group called Saka Khane, and they were um, attempting to integrate um, Islamic ideas, Shia culture from Iran, and um, also find new ways um, new modern and contemporary artistic ways of showing calligraphy. Next slide. Um, so uh, there are many artists across the Middle East uh, trying to find a way between abstraction and calligraphy, contemporary art and calligraphy. This is one of the most um, simple and amazing ones um, where he's actually written the name of God, Allah, um, with four lines. Um, it's quite amazing and it does actually say Allah in Arabic, um, and uh, he is even more interesting because his, his name is Nasser Salam, and he's um, a very classically trained calligrapher. He actually trained, he's from Mecca, and he trained in the mosque in Mecca, um, and now he's uh, a embraced contemporary art and is trying to find you know new ways in, of expressing uh, his religion through art, and he actually says he finds the most um, sort of profound things about um, Islam and about himself by creating these abstract um, canvases. It's quite interesting. Um, so, next slide. I think it's the last one. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned with Ahmed Mater, um, modern artists also address issues in, uh, in Islam today uh, that they are feeling about. Um, and issues of figuration and anti-communism, which we saw a lot of in the medieval period and the pre-modern period. Um, so this Iranian artist, Shapur um, Puyan, um, engages with issues with current anti-communism and questions of whether there should be figures um, in Islam. Um, and he does this by recreating a 15th century manuscript um, with the same mirage or Muhammad's journey scene um, but he removes Muhammad and all the images. Um, and of course, on the one hand, this is addressing anti-communism, but um, on the other hand, he's looking at the difference between modern and pre-modern um, approaches to religion and 
how individuals approach faith. 